guys are up and operational. Let's see here. And Emily should be joining. I'm going to go into the great room and get a few things set up because I want to come and stay for the first half an hour of this. But uh, you should be good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, you'll know where to find me. <laughs> That's a good luck. Like internet. <laughs> What are you doing? Trying to play a Covenberg song. Um. Something. Oh. Why not? Is your volume turned down? No. This one cell phone just needs to be. Please try again. Yeah. I'll see if you can make it work. Okay. Either one of those first two songs. It's thinking. It doesn't help that you only have one bar. I've got 99%. One bar of service. I think that's not something I can control. No. It's not going to play. We needed two bars. It's not loading. Hmm? It's not loading. Do you have your hearing aids in? Are they on? Sure. Oh, that's not the right Good morning. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Ah, uh, gosh, I'm not hearing you guys. Hold on. Okay, now I'm hearing. Are you there? Yes. Yay! Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now, now so would you screen share the poem? Yes. I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is make make it co-host and y'all can do what you need to do. Or I can sh I can uh show it up on the screen and make myself invisible. Uh, well, we want we want it up on the screen for everybody oh, okay. to see. Oh, okay. So you have the computer turned on, is and what's projecting behind uh, uh, on the screen right now? You are. I am. Okay, hold on. So, so my question is, um, can you show a thumbnail of the speaker on the side at the same time as the text? Uh, that I don't know about in Zoom, but I can definitely show the text on the screen. And um, yeah, dag on it. Hold on. Let me. Let I me. Think just... it'll, I think it will help. The... All right. There it is. U U F N N. 
channel, mm -hmm. like YouTube channel, mm -hmm. uh, usually by Tuesday evening. Okay. Okay. Welcome, Brad. Hi. Well, I think uh, I think we can begin. And so I'm lighting our, our flickering chalice here. Uh, now, not only a symbol of our uh, denomination, but also in celebration of National Poetry Month beginning tomorrow. <laughs> so we're starting early. <laughs> and, and we have to uh, help us celebrate uh, uh, that most important month of the year. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> professor Ann Keniston, uh, who is a professor of English at, uh, at UNR and uh, director of undergraduate studies, which sounds like a very impressive well, well, actually, that's out of date. I am no longer doing that. So, I see. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I thought it might be, but um, yeah. nevertheless, yes, the web uh, page lags. Uh, it, it's added to your impressive credentials. And uh, uh, she uh, uh, teaches uh, American and British uh, contemporary poetry, uh, women in poetry, and uh, I read epics as well. Yes, I am. Um, it, 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 isn't that interesting? You'd think that would be in the philosophy department. Well, yeah. But it, it, it's been well Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, her academic publications uh, include uh, um, uh, three, well, co-editing co three volumes on the poetry of, uh, of engagement. Um, uh, and uh, she's she has uh, three collections of, uh, of her own poems, uh, uh, the Caution of Human uh, Gestures, um, uh, Somatic, uh, and November Wasps, uh, um, selections of which she has read here at uh, Sunday Forum. Uh, in fact, I, uh, it, if I remember correctly, when you first began doing this every year, uh, and you were an assistant professor. I think that's right. I, yeah. so, so you have grown up academically yeah. uh, <laughs> right here in front of us. And uh, uh, graduated with honors in English uh, from the University of Chicago, uh, earned her master's degree uh, in English literature with a concentration in uh, uh, creative writing at um, uh, NYU. Uh, and uh, earned her PhD in English literature uh, uh, at Boston University. Uh, and then she promptly came here. Uh, so she's uh, twice a recipient of the uh, Academy of American Poets Prize. Uh, she's had uh, uh, artist grants from the Nevada Arts Council or the Sierra Arts Foundation. Uh, she has served uh, some six uh, poetry residencies uh, divided between the United States, Italy, and France. Um, and um, uh, and we, ju we just learned this morning that when she was in uh, uh, Po, um, uh, her, her husband had to supervise the uh, renovation of their, of their home. <laughs> Good deal for me, yeah. Uh, living in Truckee River uh, well, motels or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so um, uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce the uh, 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 program with um, uh, a couple of uh, uh, Basho um, uh, haikus. Uh, now, of course, we customarily open the Sunday Forum with an inspirational reading. But we're going to have readings throughout the hour this time, and uh, the audience can decide for themselves which ones are the inspirational ones. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, if, uh, if I could just say a couple words before we start our okay. readings, just okay. to, sure. to, to talk about the idea of landscape and poetry. Um, so this is kind of an odd uh, a combination, landscape and poetry, because normally we talk about nature poetry, um, and landscape is a visual art uh, form. Um, but I've been involved with the museum um, at their, they have this big exhibit of this painter, Maynard Dixon, who was also a poet. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote a chapter for their book on Maynard Dixon's poetry. And so I've been thinking a lot about 
landscape poetry. Um, and I just wanted to float one theory about the difference between, say, wilderness and landscape. Um, and maybe it's obvious in the words. Um, but the notion of landscape is often a humanly altered scene. So, um, which is kind of hard for us to get our mind around in a way out here in the Sierra. But when I-80 is running through the Sierra, that's, that's changing the landscape. Um, when land is farmed, as of course the Truckee Meadows were historically a farm area, that's, that's turning nature into landscape. So it gets very blurry, um, but I'm, I'm really interested in the ways that poems can engage with this visual art medium of landscape, um, and also the ways that poems can engage with, and not every poem we're looking at does this, but many of them do, uh, engage with land, with scenes, natural scenes that have been touched by humans. So mm -hmm. that's that's a little bit of background. Um, and the Maynard Dixon Show is really great. Um, and I'm actually um, hosting an event, and I believe it's April 25th over at the museum, uh, with two uh, other local poets, Gail Marie Palmeyer and Sean Griffin, who I know has spoken here. So you should check that out if you're interested. Uh, and I would add uh, on Tuesday, yes. you're giving a reading at Sunday I am. as well. Yes. Uh, with two other poets. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, and I would just add to that the poet too changes the landscape in creating the poem. Absolutely. Right? Uh, um, uh, and touches the landscape. Right? So, so Matsuo po Basho is is um, represents our our oldest poetry here, uh, a seventeenth century uh, uh, Japanese master of of haiku. Uh, now, because these are translated, not all of these poems um, follow the seven five seven syllable structure of a haiku exactly, but the, uh, some of them uh, do. And what strikes me about Basho's poems is that he focuses on one piece of the landscape and allows you to imagine the landscape surrounding that element. Um, so uh, I, I think an, an excellent example is uh, the last one listed here, a jag of lightning then flitting toward the darkness, a night heron's scream. Um, but another example is an a, a cicada shell. It sang itself utterly away. And of course, um, uh, looking at the landscape beyond those windows over there, um, uh, I, I, I should read, "'Tis the first snow, just enough to bend the gladiolus leaves." So, and. Well, I think the next poem is yours. Yes. Um, so the Romantics, the English Romantics, as many of you probably know, um, were really uh, kind of pivotal in, in turning attention to the natural landscape and finding in nature comfort and deep ideas um, and a, a kind of reflection of the human soul. Um, so Wordsworth is really the you know, kind of pioneer of this sensibility. Um, he wrote a lot of poems. He actually wrote a whole, a whole book length poem, an epic length poem, the, the length of, you know, um, Paradise Lost or, or the Odyssey about his childhood, often, you know, his experiences in nature. Um, but this poem, uh, which is a little sonnet um, poem, is interesting because it's describing an urban landscape, but in terms that are sort of borrowed from his experiences of nature. So this is composed upon Westminster Bridge, September 3rd, 1802. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. The city now doth, like a garment, wear the beauty of the morning. Silent, bare, 
ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. Um, so it kind of reminds me of driving to the fellowship this morning. <laughs> there was nobody around, right? So there's a sense that the, the heart is going to start beating and the city is going to become active and full of smoke and all those things that we associate London at that time with. But, um, but this moment of a peace in the city um, and it's, its proximity to the fields and the sky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I thought that you were going to choose something like uh, lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey, which is, of course, uh, uh, the, the natural landscape. And instead, you, you, you uh, chose the cityscape. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can you explain yourself? Well, Tintern Abbey is very long. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and I, I really was interested in the way that this is a, a, a built landscape, right? Um, and yet Wordsworth is using that same sensibility of sort of admiration and, and deriving from it this sense of, of comfort and peace uh, from, from the city. Uh, and it's a very, you know that, there's that Monet painting of, uh, of London, um, and and so I always think of that too. Um, like another, a landscape painter who also painted cathedrals and the city of London and turned that smoke that we know was toxic and suffocating into something beautiful. Mm -hmm. so. You know, it's interesting that this is a very specific point in time, September 3rd, 1802. It's early in the morning uh, before the city is awakened, as you pointed out. So it's quiet. Uh, it's it's almost unpeopled. Everyone's asleep in their in their houses, uh, and uh, apparently his sister uh, accompanied him on this occasion. Mm -hmm. Wrote about it in her diary, uh, and and uh, des describes uh, the, this scene uh, almost in the same terms. Mm -hmm. And she re refers to nature's pure light uh, as clothing the city. That there was a um, lady of London who complained to Wordsworth uh, that how could the city be clothed in a garment and bare at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> the poem just doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> actually, the, there's that semicolon there. The city doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. Pause. Silent bare ships, towers. Yeah. So perhaps those things are bare, whereas the city, where's the beauty? Um, and and one thing, I'm not an expert in romantic poetry by any means, but I think there's been a lot of interest in the ways that Wordsworth in particular and the romantics are actually engaging with some of the kinds of social issues with urbanism, um, with with industrialization uh, in their poems. So there's often even in landscape paintings of them, they're sort of like a smokestack over in the corner. You know? um, so this is the, that they weren't simply escaping from the modern world, but were, were bringing in those elements into these landscape poems. Well, the, the, first, another way to uh, confront the Lady of London uh, is to point out that uh, uh, the city is bathed in nature's pure light uh, and bare of the usual dark cloud of air pollution <laughs> that settles over the city later in the day. Right. right? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I'm I'm struck that you know it's it's almost a disguised sonnet because there's no break, but you, to to guide your eye and remind you this is a sonnet mm -hmm. um, between the octave and the and the uh, and the sestet, but uh, uh, but it does have the. Uh, uh, Abba Abba um, rhyme scheme uh, in the octave and uh, CD 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 
rhyme scheme of the sestet. So it, it, it clearly is a sonnet, as is the next one. Right. Um, so uh, uh, now, the, now the next one shifts from the English landscape to the uh, New England landscape. And uh, uh, and since since you grew up in New England, uh, I, I'll, I'll trust you to have some comments about, oh, okay. uh, yeah. about the, uh, oh, yes. the Robert Frost uh, <laughs> landscape here. Uh, this is... Um, this is the oven bird, and, and I'm hoping to show you what uh, Frost is talking about here. Oh. I hope our Zoomers can hear that. Is it called an oven bird? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a bird that makes its nest on the ground in a dome shape, oh. kind, kind of like those uh, uh, wars, uh, char charcoal ovens out in eastern Eastern Nevada. It's it's shaped like that, you know, with just one entrance. So. Turn that. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't want that. Uh, <laughs> the <back> thing, <laughs> there, turn, presentation. Okay. All right. <clears throat> There's, uh, 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 it insists. Yeah, you know how to turn it on. <laughs> all right. There is a singer. Everyone is heard. I hope you've all heard. Loud, a midsummer and midwood bird who makes the solid tree trunk sound again. He says the leaves are old and that for flowers, midsummer is to spring as one to ten. He says the early petal fall is past. When pear and cherry bloom went down in the showers on sunny days, a moment overcast. And comes that other fall we name the fall. He says the highway dust is over all. The bird would cease and be as other birds, but that he knows in singing not to sing. The question that he frames in all the words is what to make of a diminished thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I have some thoughts about this poem. Um, <laughs> so there's a tradition, and again, these earlier poems were too long to include, but there's a, a strong romantic tradition of, of writing poems like Ode to a Nightingale and Ode to a Skylark about birds that are sources of transcendence and mystery and, and immortality. Um, yeah, and uh, this sort of disembodied song. Um, and what's interesting to me about this poem is that as, as you know, Robert Frost writing in the early 20th century, probably, um, was uh, kind of speaking back to that glorious tradition um, and talking about this bird that is, is speaking, right? He's not singing. He's framing it in all but words. Um, and he's talking about diminishment. Um, so this is, seems to me to really be a rejoinder to the kind of romantic, in both senses, uh, notion of the bird as this, you know, ecstatic thing. And the oven bird, as I recall, is a pretty ordinary little plain brown bird um, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, um, and that is visible, right, because it's on the ground. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a it's a poem of sort of tiredness, right? Um, the leaves are old, and that for flowers, midsummer is to spring as one to ten. Um, the early petal fall is past. It's a poem about be, about coming too late, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and yeah, about dust. So, uh, so it's a really interesting. It's it's a, about a bird in a landscape, but it's a kind of exhausted landscape, I would say. Do you agree? He knows in singing not to sing. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's not it's not time for all this, like, you know, even though it's the song is kind of pretty. Yeah. But <laughs> not for frost, it wasn't. And again, it's about. Uh, the, the human touching the landscape too. Absolutely. Highway dust overall. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Could almost I mean, you you will notice that that we've broken these poems up into themes, 
Uh, and later on, uh, there's the theme of climate change, the landscape of climate change. And this could almost fit there, except, of course, this was written in 1916, before the civilization was conscious of, uh, of climate change. But uh, certainly the poem could be read that way in uh, 2024, I think. Right. <laughs> so, right. Uh, and uh, th there also is the sense in which um, the, the bird speaks for Frost himself. And, and there's that uh, um, line uh, in Whitman's uh, Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking, in which he evokes a mockingbird on a Long Island beach uh, uh, and explicitly says that the, uh, uh, the mockingbird projects him. Uh, and I think Frost is projecting himself in the, uh, on this bird. Right, and that, that's one way that land, all poems about nature are landscape, just as the, the painter decides what to paint and puts the frame around it and decides what color, right? That this is something constructed by a consciousness. Um, and even the fact that he wrote it in the sonnet form, um, which is a form that Frost loved, but also often kind of torqued. Many of his sonnets actually have an extra line stuck on the end. Um, so he's using this form that's, uh, you know, so of course the sonnet is usually associated with love, a love poem. Um, and neither of these, well, you could say that words were from a sort of a love poem to the bridge or the city, uh, but Frost, not so much. And, and we think of Robert Frost as being this sort of, you know, old fashioned, you know, lover of nature. Mm -hmm. um, and he really isn't. Um, he's, he's quite grumpy. Um, <laughs> if we had world enough of time, I would go into my harangue about the two roads in the yellow wood and how they actually, it didn't make any difference which one he took. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you look at his poems carefully, they're quite um, jaded uh, and cynical. Mm -hmm. And often about the stories that we tell ourselves, right? I'm going to say that I took the road less traveled by and made all the difference here. I am going into the sorry. Um, but in fact, they were the same. Mm -hmm. So we're going to tell ourselves that it made a difference, but no, I call that it been grossly misread. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so Anne, I see that the next two poems are, are actually mine. So um, or my choices. Uh, do you want to skip ahead? Uh, uh, yeah, we can move back to, we'll see how we're doing. Okay. Um, should I do the Ada Limon? I could do the Mary Oliver. Uh, whichever you prefer. Uh, well, I think we should read the Mary Oliver. Do you want to go? Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is on page five. Mary Oliver in Blackwater Woods. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, Everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this, the fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things, mm -hmm. to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is an early, early-ish poem, I believe, from Mary Oliver. I think mm -hmm. it was from American Primitive, which is her book that won the Pulitzer Prize in like 1976. Um, and I know that because uh, I, as a child, I loved poetry, and my father gave me that book um, mm -hmm. when I was when mm -hmm. I was little, before Mary Oliver was famous. I mean, she's now, you know, there's a whole. Yeah, you know, I know on my Facebook, I'm every day I get an air now for phone from somewhere. <laughs> um, but uh, but you know, she has that simple uh, these short lines that are enjammed, which means you read over the line breaks into pillars, pause of light, 
right? Um, the loose shoulders pause of the ponds. Um, and so the way that she is transforming the landscape in this first part of the poem, right? Um, they, they're, the trees have bodies, which are pillars. Um, the ponds have shoulders. Um, and then the way she moves into um, herself, I have learned in my life. And then she moves, um, as she often does in her poems, out from that even further. So from I to you, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this wonderful movement from a very specific observation that is also filled with a kind of transformation through a kind of embodiment of the natural world, right? The, the sort of imbuing the natural world with kind of a human body uh, to uh, her own kind of movement out to a, a sort of almost ecstatic, right? Abstract moment that's anchored in that first um, scene. So, yeah. yeah. So, so we've listed this under the theme of landscape as solace. Uh, and it's also about losing the landscape, right? Um, arguably, perhaps uh, due to climate change, although that may not have been conscious in the poet's mind as she, as she wrote this. Um, uh, and and for the, the loss of the landscape that we take so much spiritual value from, we need songs. <laughs> and she gives it to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and but it yeah. is absolutely, I mean, it's so imbued with loss. So with, with and, the temporariness. So the some time. some of you will remember that um, this was one of Jim Hulse's favorite poems. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and uh, you you heard it at his memorial service. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. so but I thought it was worth hearing again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but it's also a, a New England landscape, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. no, this is Cape Cod, right? Yeah. Um, so, I, so I'm going to read one more um, uh, New England landscape one. Uh, uh, and Philip Bruce uh, was a, a, a close friend of, uh, of uh, Robert Lowell. Uh, they they both lived together for uh, not together but uh, as neighbors in Castine in Maine um, uh, and uh, uh, we we, we uh, visited Castine for several days once upon a time and saw both of their homes. Uh, Lowell's home is right on a little uh, little square across from Unitarian Church. <laughs> It's still, but that's an aside. Uh, but this this evokes, uh, I think, the New England landscape in a, a wonderful way. How to see deer. Forget roadside crossings. Go nowhere with guns. Go elsewhere your own way. Lonely and wanting. Or stay and be early next to deep woods. Inhabit old orchards. All clearings promise. Sunrise is good, and fog before sun. Expect nothing, always. Find your luck slowly. Wait out the windfall. Take your good time to learn to read ferns. Make like a turtle, downhill toward slow water, instructed by heron. Drink the pure silence. Be compassed by wind. If you quiver like aspen, trust your quick nature. Let your ear teach you which way to listen. You've come to assume protected color. Now colors reform to new shapes in your eye. You've learned by now to wait without waiting. As if it were dusk, look into light falling. In deep relief, things even out. Be careless of nothing. See what you see. Well, and what do you want to read? Um, okay. Maybe I'll read Ada Lignon, who is our current poet laureate. So, so we're back to Landscape of Solace. Yeah. Um, and she is a, another poet who um, whose poems kind of verge on the ecstatic through the ordinary sometimes. Um, so this poem is called Sanctuary on the bottom of page six. 
Suppose it's easy to slip into another's skin, bury yourself in leaves and wait for a breaking uh -huh. open, a breaking, a breaking open, a uh -huh. break. Did we lose? Uh Anybody there? Hello? Up. Oh. Is there anybody on Zoom? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. So we lost the uh, Star King room. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, okay. I agree. I'm going to call Kevin right now, find out what's going on. Kevin? Yeah. Hi. So um, we can't see you. Did the camera go out there? Yes. Okay. I will call Philip right now. Yeah, I know. I'm on it. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, um, somebody who's on site, Philip Moore, is going to be um, fixing the uh, camera in the Star King room. <clears throat> if anybody wants to share a poem while we're waiting, uh, please do so. We would love to hear your landscape poems or something related to landscape. I can see your little head down at the bottom there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My head is there. About poetry, uh, saying yeah. something that can't be entirely said. And, and I think that those last few lines of her poem uh, exemplify yeah. that, uh, that that idea. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, we're so, back. Okay. I thought we ought to have at least one poem about the Nevada landscape. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and, and objected on, on the grounds that if you come to the ne uh, Nevada Museum of Art on the 25th, <laughs> yeah. you can hear all of that. <laughs> <It's the landscape. laughs> and here's on read. So, so, okay. so this, this is our, our only nod. To, uh, to the Nevada landscape. It's Sean Griffin's poem, Rain Outside Lovelock, uh, page, late March. Page four. Page four. Uh, sorry, it's hard to jump around a bit like this. Um, sorry, you got it. Oh, I, I think Emily's got it there. Um, uh, and this also is about uh, humans touching the landscape and uh, changing the landscape. The first whispers poke from greasewood, clouds salt the ridge beyond an alfalfa farm. A roadside cross pretends to grieve, and the few willows reach to rye patch, a last body of water before the dry, endless miles. This could be the road to Inubik, and there is no warrior at the horizon. The landscape is quarantined, a desert peach offers pink rosaries, to the slopes graded for minerals, once white and hard with tranquility, now dust in the atmosphere. This is what the desert surrenders to the magpie bloated on the center line, 
to fresh prints at the petroglyphs to the feral galaxy of spring. Wow. So, so once again, we see dust mm. as exemplifying the human impact uh, on, the, on the landscape. Yeah. So, so yeah. he's channeling Robert Frost right. just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, that, that I think both in the Ovenberg uh, and maybe here, uh, there, there is, of course, the allusion to the biblical uh, characterization as dust is what we come from and what we return to mm -hmm. uh, in the landscape also. Right, with the uh, yeah. the um, the roadside cross and, and, and frost, you know, comes the other fall we name the fall, you know, mm -hmm. the, the sort of pun on the fall, the biblical fall. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's not not just the magpie that's dead here. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, um, um, and it's your turn. Okay, I think I would like to read a poem that I think I've read in another uh, poetry form, but it's it's such a great poem. Um, I'd like to read it again, um, which is on page eight, um, the autumn poem. Um, and I believe we did a... Um, a forum on poetry about art uh, oh, several years ago. Um, yeah, yeah, the process. Yeah. Um, and this is, and of course, there is a, a huge tradition of poems about paintings um, and poems about landscape painting. Um, so this is one of those. Um, I think the key, uh, the, the, the reason that we put this under landscape and social critique is that this was written, I believe, in 1939. Um, so just keep that in mind. Musée de Beaux-Arts. And it's about a, a famous Bruegel painting um, that you might have seen where called The Fall of Icarus. It's described in the poem. Basically, it's a giant landscape, and then you the only sign of Icarus are these two little legs sticking out of the water. Um, Musée de Beaux-Arts. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters how well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along, how when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who do not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him, it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sail calmly on. Mm -hmm. um, so, he doesn't talk about the political situation at the time, um, but it's it's there in the background. I think it, it I mean, I've loved this poem for decades, um, but when I realized that, it, it kind of opened up this whole idea that this whole poem is an allegory for, for what was going on at, in the- yeah, Neville the Chamberlain is the problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> Noticing all right. into the ocean. Exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's interesting, you know, going back to the oven bird, that was written in 1916, mm -hmm. around the time that Frost and his family were in Europe and left Europe as World War I broke out. Yeah, and it was a, interesting. Yeah. 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 And this, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how that first sentence of the poem, how different it would be if it said, the old masters were never wrong about suffering. And the fact that he puts it into this about suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. What a, what a difference that makes. It, it makes the poem sort of much more conversational. 
and casual almost. Um, so I've, I've just spent a lot of time thinking about that phrase. And it puts suffering in front. Yeah, right. It's interesting, both of the two landscape examples are from Bruegel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, William and Carlos Williams, so my, I'm so sorry we left out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would surprise you. Did, yeah. You cut him. Yeah, how did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> but but uh, he, wrote, he wrote a poem, I think after this, uh, focusing particularly on the fall of Icarus. Uh, very uh, similar kind of theme. Uh, and then he expanded on it and wrote a whole book of pictures from Bruegel. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Uh, well, um, since we're on um, uh, the landscape and social critique, uh, shall I wear, read the Lucille Clifton poem? Anyway. Uh, this this makes it look like at 88 she's still alive, but actually she died in 2010, right? Uh, I think later than that, but yeah. Okay, well, yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> contrary to, to the citation here, uh, she is not still alive. The earth is a living thing, is a black shambling bear, ruffling its wild back and tossing mountains into the sea, is a black hawk circling the bur bur burying ground, circling the bones, picked clean and discarded, is a fish black blind in the belly of the water, is a diamond blind in the black belly of coal, is a black and living thing, is a favorite child of the universe, feel her rolling her hand in its kinky hair, Feel her brushing it clean. Hmm. And Lucy Clifton has a, a slight connection to our area because she was on the faculty at the Community of Writers up in Olympic Valley for years um, and was beloved. Um, her poems are, are, I mean, they've really been getting their sort of critical do. Um, and actually a, a book is just about to come out or it's just come out about her poems, but the kind of um, humility of her poems with the small letters, they're very short. She had a lot of children and she said she had to write them, you know, quickly while the kids were going to sleep, <laughs> you know, during a nap she had, that was the time she had. Um, but yeah, the way that the simple language is, you know, reveals this whole kind of social critique. So I recommend her. She's a very accessible poet and poet who's very easy to love. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, she writes a great deal about, about being Black, about being a woman, um, and uh, about spirituality. Yeah, and about history, yeah, U.S. Yeah. history. And, and this seems a very spiritual poem. So, yeah. Yeah. so um, but um, it's also under, under the theme of the landscape and social critique. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, well, and I think it's your turn. Okay, so let me do the Abbey and Ridge poem um, on page 10. Um, so this is part of a, a long poem and I think 12 parts. Um, this is the, the opening of the poem, um, but it's, and it's actually the title of the poem in, in her book, and that was of the difficult world. So Adrian Ridge was a poet um, from New England who, who lived in California and wrote a lot about the Central Valley. Um, um, and this I think is, is a really powerful poem because it's about the landscape and, and how, well, it's about agriculture and how we get our strawberries and things. An atlas of the difficult world. A dark woman, head bent, listening for something, a woman's voice, a man's voice, or voice of the freeway, night after night, metal streaming down coast past eucalyptus, cypress, agribusiness, empires, the salad bowl of the world, Gur of small planes dusting the strawberries, each berry picked by a hand in close communion, strawberry blood on the wrist, malathion in the throat, communion, the hospital at the edge of the fields, 
prematures slipping from unsafe wounds, the labor and delivery nurse on her break, watching planes dusting rows of pickers. Elsewhere, declarations are made at the sink, rinsing strawberries flopped and gleaming, gleaming fresh from market. One says, on the pond this evening is a light finer than my mother's handkerchief received from her mother, hemmed and initialed by the nuns in Belgium. One says, I can lie for hours reading and listening to music, but sleep comes hard. I'd rather lie awake and read. One writes, mosquitoes pour through the cracks in this cabin's walls. The road in winter is often impassable. I live here so I don't have to go out and act. I'm trying to hold on to my life. It feels like nothing. One says, I never knew from one day to the next where it was coming from. I had to make my life happen from day to day, every day an emergency. Now I have a house, a job from year to year. Mm -hmm. um, so I, for me, this is just an incredibly powerful poem that is mm -hmm. giving voice to, right? And I actually sure. read, I was doing all this research on landscape and I read a whole article about, you know, strawberry, uh, cultivation in California mm -hmm. and the ways that that is concealed from us mm -hmm. and these horrible conditions in which the workers, you know, migrant workers are, are picking our strawberries and that we don't, we, we, that's hidden from us when we buy our strawberries at the market. So are, are these invented quotes? Are they real I quotes? don't know. I, I feel like they're probably invented, but I don't, I don't know. Um, but there's certain so specific the the mother's handkerchief, um, the writing, um, and the poem actually ends with another section where she's imagining her readers, um, and and also very specific. I know you were reading this poem. It's a poem that, that makes me moved um, about the the different conditions of her readers. Um, yeah. Yeah, actually that, that phrase is from the 13th section, which is which is kind of a um kind of a way of making us feel better about the previous 12 sections <laughs> that we've read, right? Yeah. All right. But but it 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 strikes me uh as as a position because uh it, it says, I know you're reading this poem late before leaving the office. Yeah. Um, um and of the one intense yellow uh, lamp spot and the darkening windows. I know you were reading this poem in a room where too much has happened for you to bear. Um, and, I, and of course, that makes, as a physician, makes me think of all of the patients and their sad stories, sometimes happy, but certainly a good deal of tragedy um, every day. Uh, and, uh, yeah. yeah, and and the idea that poetry can be, I mean, the, just the idea of writing an atlas, a poem that is this comprehensive atlas, but of the diff, of a difficult world. Um, That's why it's so long. Yes, and it, it definitely is a poem that, if you know Walt Whitman's uh, poem, is sort of talking back to that. I think uh, song of myself, which is a kind of more of a celebration of the American landscape. But anyway, <laughs> very powerful. Well, I'll read the Joy Harjo on page 12. Um, uh, and, and we've included this under the uh, uh, theme, the, the mystic landscape. <laughs> uh, and, and she uh, begins with an epigraph from Sandra Cisneros. I had a beautiful dream I was dancing with a tree. Some things on this earth are unspeakable, genealogy of the broken, a shy wind threading leaves after a massacre or the smell of coffee and no one there. Some humans say trees are not sentient beings, but they do not understand poetry, nor can they hear the singing of the trees when they are fed by wind or water music or hear their cries of anguish when they are broken into rest. Now I am a woman longing to be a tree, 
planted in a moist, dark earth between sunrise and sunset. I cannot walk through uh, all realms. I carry a yearning I cannot bear alone in the dark. What shall I do with all this heartache? The deepest rooted dream of a tree is to walk, even just a little ways, from the place next to the doorway to the edge of the river of life and drink. I have heard trees talking long after the sun has gone down. Imagine what it would be like to dance close together in this land of water and knowledge, to drink deep what is undrinkable. Um, I'd like to start something. Yes. Speaking trees, I had the occasion to be invited to go on a walk. You know, there was a tree that I was this big telling about. And I just walked up to it and leaned my entire body against it. And all of a sudden, I started to feel my heartbeat beating in the tree. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was the other way I did. Yeah. I mean, I have found such um, healing in nature, so I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, well, there's there's all this new, uh, new studies of the two things. One is that there are some kind of chemicals or something that are released when by, when we walk in nature, we feel better because of some physiological thing that's happening. Um, and it's also been known for a while, but it's sort of, there's new attention to it. The trees actually do speak to one another, um, mm -hmm. that they communicate and they protect. It's not uh, the model of kind of competition that is central to animal studies, but that they're actually sort of saying, oh, wait, you know, there, there's a, a, a disease coming, be careful. <laughs> uh, that there are ways that they communicate through the, the canopy. Um, yeah, and there's actually, if you if you like to read fiction, there's a very long, uh, amazing book by a, an author named Richard Powers called The Overstory, um, which is about, uh, it's about climate activists actually, but it's it has these long descriptions of different trees and it's a lot about the ways that trees communicate with one another. Um, so yeah, yeah, through the root system too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think there's, there's research been done on that, but definitely that feeling of being comforted by being among trees is. Joni Mitchell says, stand beneath the trees and see how tall you are. <laughs> That's what she's about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, maybe um, uh, we're, we're having to skip most of the climate change poems, which is perhaps gonna be cheery. We can read them on. Oh, yeah, we have time for one. Do you think? Okay. Yes, you will. All right. Yeah. Um, I've lost, I've lost that section. Oh, I see. It's before oh, the mystic nature. All right. Well, let me. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and I, I like. I will say that there are many, many poets being written, poems being written in the last ten years, um, especially in the last five years, about climate change. Um, so here's one by Dorian Lott, who's a semi-local poet. Evening. Moonlight pours down without mercy. This is page 11. Moonlight pours down without mercy, no matter how many have perished beneath the trees. The river rolls on. There will always be silence, no matter how long someone has wept against the side of a house, bare forearms pressed to the shingles. Everything ends, even pain, even sorrow. The swans drift on, reeds bear the weight of their feathery head, pebbles grow smaller, smoother beneath night's rough currents. We walk long distances, carting our bags, our packages, burdens, or gifts. 
We know the land is disappearing beneath the sea, islands swallowed like prehistoric fish. We know we are doomed, done for, damned, and still the light reaches us, falls on our shoulders even now, even here where the moon is hidden from us, even though the stars are so far away. But that almost fall on their landscape as solace. Right, right. I mean, it's <laughs> certainly not as depressing as, as, so, as it could be. <laughs> so, so even the landscape is disappearing, and still the light falls upon us. Right, right. <laughs> that we, we hold to yeah. right our experiences with the trees. Yeah. 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 Um, well, in the, uh, I guess the the, the spirit of. Um, Lands, uh, the mystic landscape, uh, uh, and and I'll I'll read David Wagner's Lost because um, it's nice and nice and short, and we have um, five or six minutes uh, left to go here. Um, uh, uh, David David Wagner uh, uh, was um, I think uh, cha Chancellor of the uh, Academy of American Poets and won the push. Kurt uh, Prize twice and, and so on. He was the poet laureate of, of Washington State, I think, and a uh, editor of uh, Northwest. Poetry uh, Northwest. Poetry yeah. Northwest, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, he uh, uh, was born in Ohio, grew up in Idaho, and in 1954, he uh, moved west, and he said as he came over the Cascades and dropped down to the uh, uh, the, the coastal uh, plateau. It was like a transformation uh, took place, and he spent the rest of his life uh, <laughs> on the on the Washington coast uh, uh, among tall trees. So uh, this this is entitled "Lost." Uh, it it's uh, uh, very much. Uh, like the Philip Booth poem that I read earlier, I think. But at the opposite coast. <laughs> Stand still. The trees ahead and bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here, and you must treat it as a powerful stranger, must ask permission to know it and be known. The forest breathes. Listen, it answers. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying here, no two trees are the same to raven, no two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. So. Mm -hmm. And that use of you, as in the Philip Booth poem, the use of the second person, right? And that kind of immediacy of that, the imperative, right? Stand still. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Well, maybe I'll read my poem, um, which is, yeah, it came out double space. It's on page 14. Um, so I, um, got a grant from the Nevada Arts uh, Council a, a few years ago to do a series of poems on Western land art um, or earthworks art. Um, so these are these giant things that people put up in the desert. There's one that just opened called City down in somewhere in <laughs> South Nevada, that's very hard to get to. Um, and um, so these poems are very kind of talky. I, I did a lot of research um, and, uh, and somehow the italic switch of quotations got lost in, in the copying process. But um, so this poem is about Spiral Jetty, which is perhaps the most famous piece of land art. Um, it's in outside of Salt Lake City in Salt Lake, um, although now it's not in Salt Lake because the lake has receded so that it's not in the water anymore. This is on page 14. A giant fishing hook suspended in Great Salt Lake is what Robert Smithson tried first, then remade in homage to inanimate crystalline structures or a whirlpool or nearby petroglyphs, 
his construction, a memorial to local indigenous people displaced or killed nearby, or an emblem of the empty Western vista inscribed with human memory, a set of contradictions the spiral represents. Or he just liked that shape, and I'm overthinking this, especially since entropy is how change mostly appears, the stone construction submerged for a decade, but since 2002 exposed a useless berm raised driveway widget on a stalk, its changes in appearance documented in annual photos taken by the foundation tasked with looking after it, though they can't intervene even if the thing unravels or collapses or gets vandalized by the curious who arrive in gas guzzling SUVs the rutted washboard road requires. Pilgrims or weirdos, I'm not sure which. In any case, I've decided not to make the trip, which, may, which might be why this is my favorite work of land art, though apparently it underwhelms up close. Self-defeating, says one critic, purposeless, an anti-ecological emblem of catastrophe, the antithesis of Stacey Levy's homage critique, a spiral of floating mass of recyclable synthetic material that extract excess polluting nutrients from the tainted water. By now, the elements once hidden under Great Salt Lake are blowing into town in plumes, a toxic cloud abetted by farmers who still grow thirsty crops, spiral days, sorry, spiral jetty these days, not a metaphor or thing of beauty or elegance, but a harbinger, a bellwether left high and dry. Yeah, I, I, I love the way um, the, the the first line is the is the title and and hooks into the poem. <laughs> <laughs> is that the way you thought of it? Well, I, all the poems were all all of these poems have the title run in, so I I love what you're saying, but I, I don't know if it's total oh, sadly well, intentional. <laughs> Yeah. There it is. And nevertheless, yeah. it's there. Whether yeah. you meant it or not. Right. Yeah. And, and there are a lot of citations. And Stacey Levy uh, 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 is is this it was was in like Arkansas, but a totally different function. I mean, it really had a, an ecological function. Um, so yeah. Well, Robert Smithson was born in 1936 in um, Passaic, uh, New Jersey, uh, and later Rutherford. And he, um, William Carlos Williams was his pediatrician, uh, <laughs> which, which uh, just utterly delights me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he, he wrote uh, a lot of uh, art criticism. Uh, and entropy was right. a major theme. Yes. So uh, that, in, in, the, in the original poem, that's italicized, along with a lot of the kind of descriptions of widget on the stock and all that are, are those are all actual things that uh they that it has been phrases. called well those aren't his phrases um but entropy certainly was the central idea the idea yes. that things sort of naturally fall apart right right yeah, yeah. yeah. even though um i mean well there's a land art piece called double negative in southern nevada um by um sorry i'm not thinking of his name uh uh, Michael Heiser. Anyway, it's this thing that we, we went to visit um, also in a <laughs> rented at like this huge SUV that we had to use to get there. Uh, but anyway, it's it's these cuts into the cliff and the idea was to let them just fall apart and they are falling apart and now Heiser is like, no, no, I we have to preserve them. <laughs> so, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to fix those. Don't let them fall apart. So well, yeah, to yeah. Almost all of Smithson's um, land art compositions, in fact, are falling apart. Yes, well, they all are. Oh, um, they, yeah. I mean, all all land art is not not the city. I, I think there's one in the Netherlands that hasn't fallen apart. Uh -huh. in, you know, <laughs> the little lake, and you know, yeah. things don't change as much there. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. Well, <laughs> excuse me. I just wanted to let everybody know it's past ten o'clock. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's that's right. not your fault. Not your fault. Okay. No, it's, but we have to hear Kevin's. Voice. Well, thank you. Um, and, 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 and thank you, too, for something else. Um, you know, I'm 
I am accustomed to being introduced as a doctor or physician. And uh, uh, when we met you at the symphony, um, uh, there, there were others around and you introduced me as a poet. And that's the first time <laughs> that has ever happened. And as I approach semi-retirement and we'll have more time to write, that's a wonderful beginning. <laughs> and thank you very, very much. <laughs> uh, in any case, um, when, when I'm not writing about Aeschylus uh, uh, or Cicero or, or Stravinsky, um, uh, my most common inspirations come from my backyard. <laughs> and this is this is this is an example, uh, and um, uh, and I would also commend the poem that comes after it by uh, by Bruce uh, Laxall, also about his backyard. Um, it, it's a wonderful poem, and one that he read here not long before he died of ALS. Uh, most of us had a hard time hearing him because his voice was so thin and so weak. Um, but it's a very affecting poem, and I, I would commend it to you uh, to read uh, to read later. And those of you who are on Zoom, um, uh, I will, if you're on our email list, uh, I will send these poems out to you. Uh, if you're not on our email list, let me know. Uh, I can get you on the email list and um, and also get you the poems. Um, uh, and of course, those of you who are in the room have the poems. Um, so this is under the theme of the garden as landscape. Pruning the Spitzenberg. Now also, by the way, these are explicit instructions on how to prune an apple tree. So even if you don't find an inspiring one, <laughs> you might find it useful <laughs> when you uh, prune your apple tree. I love poems from art. <laughs> Very practical. Yeah. Is Spitzenberg a type of apple? Pardon me? Is Spitzenberg a type of apple? Yeah, Spitzenberg is a wonderful apple. It's a delicious, delicious. apple. Delicious. I've never seen it. It's Thomas Jefferson's favorite apple. Oh. There you go. And if the audience didn't hear that, Thomas Jefferson's favorite apple. Take the branches that rise straight up on this crisp, clear day near March. The water sprouts, young sprout shoots that sap the tree and drain it of life for new apples, apples that the squirrels will get before us. Along the fallen branches are fruiting spurs that now can give rise to no apples, apples sacrificed for other apples to grow from older branches, apples that the squirrels will get before us. Chop the branches into segments, little ones to mulch the orchard, thick ones to feed the cottontail that edges timidly out of the dry stack wall as we leave dreaming of apples, apples that the squirrels will get before we do. In two months' time, apple blossoms, then pips, and the golden light of sunsets. In three months, the squirrels will be well fed. It is no mean thing to work this hard for rabbits and squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with, with that, uh, we'll uh, uh, close our uh, celebration of National Poetry Month. And Anne, thank you very, yeah. very much for oh, bringing your And your voice for poetry. Um, and next, next, week. Um, this is a fifth Sunday. You know, we take fifth Sundays if they happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, so this was opportune. Uh, and we usually meet the first and third. So that means next Sunday already is the first Sunday of April. Uh, and we'll have uh, a little bit more poetry. Uh, Sean Griffin is going to be here to talk about teaching poetry to the inmates of the Northern Nevada Correction Center. Uh, I think we have uh, a great deal to learn from uh, his uh, insights and experience um, in that uh, in that setting. Uh, thank you, Emily, for for uh, affirming <laughs> <laughs> my closing statement. So, uh, uh, happy Easter, everyone, and thank you again, Anne. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you all. <laughs> Yay, poets! <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Yeah. <laughs>